11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter 11, if you will, which is known as the great chapter on what? Faith. On faith, yeah. The faith chapter, Hebrews 11. Now, don't misunderstand the word faith. It is not just something that you believe in your head. But it's very clear in Hebrews 11 that faith is a verb. Uh, it's what you believe in your head that gets lived out in your life, in your actions. From Adam's son, Abel, to Israel's deliverers and kings and prophets. But most of these people were just ordinary. And the, the success that they had to move forward depended upon the fact that they were looking to an extraordinary God that would enable them. So I want to take a few minutes and just, in our Bible study tonight, share some thoughts with you about faith from Hebrews 11. Let's pause a moment and let's depend upon God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful chapter of Scripture. And we think of the great exploits and feats that were successfully accomplished by these individuals that are mentioned here in what has been called the Heroes Hall of Faith. And we do pray that as we think along these lines that you would help us to really understand what believing faith is and as a result of it, that we would uh, exercise it on a regular basis in our lives. We know it's the difference between being saved and lost, but it's also the difference between living a victorious Christian life and struggling in defeat. So Lord, open our spiritual eyes that we might see and that as a result, our lives would bring great glory to you as these ones that are mentioned here did. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to think about the, the purpose of life. And really, it's summed up in this 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. When you read the chapter, you realize that what life is all about for the believer is finding out God's purpose for your life, and then depending upon him to accomplish it. What is life's purpose for you? Of course, you and I aren't expected to be an Abraham or a Moses or a David, but our life's goal is really to be exactly the same as theirs. Let me tell you what, it, what uh, that amounts to. In every single one of these individuals, the purpose of God in their life that they fulfilled began with the fact that they met with God. Each one of these people met with God. Every single one of them points to a personal encounter that they had with the Lord. And you know, if you have had a personal encounter with the Lord, you know it. You know that you have met with God. And uh, if you haven't experienced an encounter with the Lord, if you've met with the Lord, you should and you never will get over it. You'll forever be impacted by it. In fact, if you meet with God, if you have a personal encounter with the Lord, it will be the thing that motivates you. It will be the, the thing that drives you and that will always bring you back to it whenever fears or doubts pop up in your life. You will remember that you had a personal meeting with God, and it forever impacted you. There's a second thing in the purpose uh, that we find in the lives of these faithful individuals. Not only did they meet with God, but as a result of meeting with God, they were moved by God. It was not just that they were following their dreams. 
It was not just that they were doing their own thing in their life. But because they met with God, they knew precisely what their life was about and why they were here. You'll never find an individual in the scripture or outside of the scripture for that matter that has had a genuine encounter with God that is confused about what happened and what God wanted. When God meets with a person, it moves that person each one of these individuals met with God, were moved by God to clearly know what their mission in life was, and they then stepped up in order to do it, which leads me to a third part of the purpose. They met with God, they were moved by God, and they then ministered or served through God. What I mean by that is simply this. About 25 times in this 11th chapter, you'll find a reference to that word faith or faithful. They had a personal meeting with God, and they received as a result of that a God-given mission. But that God-given mission that they were moved to fulfill could only be accomplished by them personally counting on God to enable them to do it. That's what I mean when I say they ministered through God, because that's what faith is. Faith is knowing what God wants you to do and stepping out in complete dependence upon him to enable you to do it. So chapter 11 is about purpose in life. And it's connected to that matter of faith, but also second thing I want you to see, drop down with me, if you will, in this chapter to the 34th verse, toward the end of the of 11, Hebrews 11. He says he's describing different people uh, in verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. I think we know who that might be. Verse 34, quench the violence of fire. Perhaps we know who those people might be. And then escape the edge of the sword. And then I want you to note this phrase in verse 34 of Hebrews 11. Out of weakness were made strong. That is the secret that is the absolute secret of fulfilling God's purpose by faith in your life. They're encouraged to know the mighty works that God wanted to do through. Now think about each one of these people. For instance, uh, in verse 32, it talks about a man named Barak or Barak. He was unwilling to do what God called him to do unless a woman who was a prophetess would be supportive of him. Doesn't sound like a very strong man, does it? And then also, the next guy in that chapter, Samson. Oh, well, we know Samson had a big problem. He was a man of lusts that were uncontrolled. He was a man that had an anger issue. He was a man that was full of himself, very proud. And yet he's listed here. My point is simply this. I, I take this as an encouragement for myself as well. And that is this, that God uses flawed people to do great things, to, do, to accomplish mighty things. In fact, if we're really honest and think about it, that's all God's ever had to work with, is a bunch of flawed people. We're all a mess. We all have our warts. We all have our, our issues. And so God is dealing with us as he's using us as well. I've often said from the first time that I ever stepped into church planting, that God was more interested in building me than he was in building a church. At least that's the way I felt. 
So here is the secret in this 34th verse, how God takes flawed, weak people and does great things through them. First of all, he says, out of weakness, they were made strong. The secret of God using you, me, or anyone is, first of all, that we acknowledge our weakness. Acknowledge your weakness. And to do that, that requires humility. You are opening up yourself for God to show you your personal inability to be able to do what God's asking you to do. I can't do it, Lord. I don't have the ability. I'm too weak to do that. I'm unable. It's something God often calls people to do things that you can't do. You just can't do it. He might ask you to do something that's totally against your personality. It's not your strength because he wants you to learn to, first of all, acknowledge your weakness. That what God wants you to do is absolutely impossible without God's enablement. If you can do it without God's enablement, God's not in it. Because you're doing it in the flesh. And the Bible says that the flesh profits nothing. It may impress people. It might get the applause of men. But if you're not doing it in dependence upon God, it's worthless. It doesn't accomplish the purpose of God. So first of all, the secret is to acknowledge your weakness. And secondly, he says, out of weakness, they were made strong. That is, access God's power. Only by acknowledging your personal weakness are you prepared then to get God's strength in your life. Because your weakness is intended to drive you to depend upon God's power. But you know what? Just acknowledging your weakness does not access God's power in your life. You have to do that. But to really access God's power requires several things. First of all, it requires a clean heart. You want God's power in your life? then your heart has to be right with him. You have to be depending upon the precious blood of Jesus that is able to cleanse you of all sin. And then, well, how did uh, David say it? He said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. And then also accessing God's power not only requires a clean heart, but I believe it requires a faith on your part, a dependence on your part that would cause you to ask God for his power. Jesus said it this way. He said, if a son asks his father for uh, a fish, he won't give him a serpent. If he asks him for bread, he won't give him a stone, etc. He says, and how much more Will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And he's not talking about the Holy Spirit indwelling you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit enabling you, empowering you. And so I believe that not only to access God's power must you be clean in heart, but you must ask, but you ask believing that if you ask, he's going to give what you ask for. And that leads me to the third thing, to access God's power, a clean heart, asking, but not just then walking away, but taking by faith what you've asked for. In other words, believing what God says. If you ask me, I'll give it to you. And so you take it. You know, Jesus said this in the the vine chapter of John 15. He says, and we know this phrase, without me, you can do nothing. Well, you know what the implication is the opposite of that. With me, you can do anything that I ask you to do. Paul put it this way. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, or who infuses his power into my life. And so, as you, someone said, took forgiveness from the hand of the dying Christ, take power from the hand of the living Christ. What power do you need? 
Do you need victory over sin? Some sin that you always fall into the temptation of? You can take that by faith. You can access God's power and have victory over any sin. You can take from God's hand the power to serve God. You can take the strength from God to endure any trial that you face. You can take from God's hand and access the power to uh, love and forgive your enemies, whatever it might be. So here's the secret. Out of weakness, these heroes of the faith were made strong. And that meant that they had to acknowledge their weakness in order to access God's power. And what was that for? So that we say, oh, wasn't Samson a mighty man? No, it was to advertise God's glory. That's what it was all about. So when you successfully are enabled, that simply is a platform in order to spread God's fame and make his name great in the circles of people that you interact with and that know you. It's a way for you to make God great in their eyes. So are you, are we trusting God to do anything beyond our own human ability? Are we trusting God to do something in and through our lives that there's no human explanation for it? It's got to be God. It's got to be a God thing that can only be attributable to God at work in through me. Out of weakness, they were made strong. That's the only way to experience God's power in your life. Hudson Taylor who was the founder of what was then called the China Inland Mission, he knew the secret of strength through weakness. One time a friend complimented him on the impact of his mission agency, and Taylor answered and said, you know what? It seems to me like God was looking around the whole world until he found a man weak enough. And he said, yeah, he'll do. And he said, that's me. And then he went on to say this, and this is significant. All God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on him being with them. I want you to see in closing the description of a person that simply has purposed to depend upon God to accomplish whatever he wants to accomplish through them. Look at verse uh, 38. It says of these people that were treated and tormented and, and horribly treated. He says, of whom the world was not worthy. That's a parenthetical thought. You see that? It's in parentheses. It's like, okay, just incidental. But to me, that's, that's significant. All of these people summed up. You know what the description of them is? The world's not worthy of them. These are people that uh, the Bible says in verse 2, they obtained a good report. They had a good reputation among the people of God and before God. In verse 39, again, they obtained a good report or a good, they had a good reputation in God's book, not the world's book. In fact, they're too good for this world. That's what it means in verse 39, of whom the world was not worthy. These people that depend upon God to do the will of God, they're too good for this world, is what he's saying. You want to be one of them? I do. And here's how. It's very simple. You admit your inability by following God, exercising your dependence upon him, and you can then be described by God as being too good for this world. 